Welcome back to our Bible study. We'll continue with chapter 5 of St. John's Gospel and begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, O Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John the Apostle, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, welcome back. We are continuing with chapter 5 of St. John's Gospel. We will cover just that chapter today and pick up with another miracle of our blessed Lord. And it will go into this chapter and delve into the divinity of our Lord, especially in this chapter. So let's take a look at some of those themes we saw before in the Bible, in this gospel. These are the seven themes that we see, major themes. Today we're going to see this theme of the voice of God showing up. We'll also see... Uh, the theme of the hour, briefly you'll see that come in. And then there is the idea of testimony. Our blessed Lord uh, has testimony born about him. And then there's a couple of minor themes, if you recall. There's the, today we're just going to see that number six on that, the, uh, the seven sacraments. And so that's sort of where we will begin because the first part of this chapter uh, speaks about the miracle that our Lord performs, and it is another one of those signs, as St. John says, semeon in the Greek, to show that this is a, a sign of something else. This is uh, a sign of one of the seven sacraments. So, in this miracle that happens, uh, let's, let's take a look. It happens right at the beginning. Uh, by the way, I am here in front of the old city of Jerusalem, the old city walls behind me. Uh, you can see the, uh, the pool of Probatica, which we'll get to in a moment here. And then here on the other side, uh, you see the, uh, the temple. And then uh, immediately uh, behind me, the towers behind me, the, those are the towers of the fortress Antonina, where our blessed Lord was brought before Pontius Pilate, where he was scourged, crowned with thorns. And so what we are looking at, we are looking at from the east side, we're looking towards the west, and this pool of Probatica, or Bethsaida, uh, Probatica means uh, sheep pond, Bethsaida means uh, uh, house of, of uh, fish. And uh, so this is a, um, the place where the scene takes place. You can actually see that today, and we're, we'll take a look at uh, some images from the Holy Land here. So recall the words. Now there is at Jerusalem a pond called Probatica, which is in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porches. So here is that image of Bethsaida with its five porches. So uh, what do we mean by five porches? Let's get the pointer up here. So the five porches are uh, there visible right here. So the way they've enumerated these five is there's a porch here down this way, with porticos, five porticos, you'll see it sometimes written. Another one here, another one here, another one here. So the four sides plus this one here is the fifth portico, five porticos. And so as you can see it today, here is the site of that place. Uh, Beth said, this is, this is the place where the portico was and where those people are. We'll get a closer view here in a second. Where those people are, down there is where the pool was. You're looking down now at where the pool was. Here is a remnant of one of the porches. Another one crossed over uh, this way, I should say, right on this side. Here is another crossing. So there was a pool here, a pool here, and these five porches formed uh, a large square, large rectangle. Uh, and this is a pool. There's actually still some water that you can see down here, but um, it's, it's not like an active pool anymore. So this is the site of our blessed Lord's uh, miracle uh, today. 
And so in this um, miracle, we see this man who is languishing there. He's been there 38 years. That number is important. We're going to see why in a second. And he's been languishing there 38 years. And there was that miracle that would happen that whenever the waters were stirred, so the spirit would move over the waters. You can see here the uh, evocation of Genesis 1, chapter 2, where the Spirit hovered over the waters. The Spirit would move, come down, stir up the waters in this notable way. It wasn't just the wind blowing the water. And so the first one who would enter the water at that point would be healed. It showed the person's, you know, that you could see there's an aspect of cooperation on the part of the person. He had to go down, enter into the water. And, uh, but the miracle, of course, happened not because the waters were, were themselves miraculous. St. Thomas points that out because it didn't happen at other times when, when that special stirring up of the waters that happened, that's when the miracle would take place, not just immersing yourself in the water. And so this man had been languishing there for, uh, he'd been languishing under this infirmity, I should say, not necessarily sitting at this porch for 38 years, but he was under this infirmity uh, for 38 years. St. Thomas says this number has a particular meaning, and this is what St. Thomas says about it. He says the number 40 signifies the perfection of justice, which consists in observing uh, the law. Okay, so the law, of course, is uh, tenfold. You have the, the, uh, the Ten Commandments, that's summary of the law. But the law was given in ten precepts, and it was to be completed, fulfilled, by the four Gospels. So the ten times forty is where you get this number of perfection of justice, fulfillment of the law. The law of the Old Covenant, ten commandments, which still apply today, it's the natural law. And then with the four Gospels, uh, that's how St. Thomas is, that we get the number forty. So why was this number thirty-eight? Uh, 38 years, um, well, St. Thomas has an answer to that. He says that if 2 is subtracted from 40, we get 38. And this 2 is the two precepts of charity. And so this man was sick because he had 40 minus 2. For on these two commandments, all the law and the prophets depend. Now, we might wonder about his uh, enumeration of that, but that's exactly what the fathers uh, agree on, that uh, this man fell short of the law. He fell short by two. And these two are the two commandments. Remember, they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? The first and greatest commandment, our Lord gives him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, thy whole mind, thy whole soul, thy whole strength. And the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. So he was not able to fulfill that. Perfect love of God, perfect love of neighbor, until our Lord came. That's why he represented mankind this man languishing there for 38 years, or languishing under this infirmity for 38 years, he represents mankind who fell short of that perfection. Perfection represented by the number, a perfection of justice represented by the number 40. And so uh, he needed our Lord's uh, help. And so he received that help. We, we, uh, we saw, what, we see what happens in this, uh, in this miracle. Uh, let's see what, what happened then. The infirm man said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pond, it, it says in verse 7. For when I am coming, another goes down before me. And then our Lord said to him, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was healed. The man was made whole, and uh, our blessed uh, uh, Lord did this on the Sabbath day. So, uh, this is that Sabbath controversy that that takes place uh, once again. This uh, this is whole there's a whole problem. This he's always healing on the Sabbath it seems, and the Jews are always taking issue with that. But our blessed Lord is making a point that he is Lord of the Sabbath, and that this uh, this Sabbath day was actually to be replaced by another day. We see that in Hebrews chapter four, verse four. And, and verse 8, so Hebrews 4, verse 8, speaks of this other day, this new day of rest for the people of God. And that's one of the proof texts, actually, uh, for the, uh, the idea of this, the old Sabbath being uh, replaced. So, why does he have him carry the, the bed 
and why is this uh, an issue to the Jews? St. Gregory the Great makes a little explanation of that. Let's see what he says. In homily 12 in Ezekiel, St. Gregory the Great says, The sick man restored to health is bidden to carry the bed in which he had been carried. Take up thy bed and go in, in, unto thy house. That is to say, bear the temptations of the flesh. Carry those, because he still has those temptations. Bear with those in which thou hast hitherto lain. But now, the man is now in control of those, as opposed to him being upheld or supported by those. So those temptations of the flesh in which he had lain, represented by that infirmity of 38 years, that's what he was laying in. He was laying in that weakness of sin, and now he is carrying it. Now he is master of it. He is still bearing those temptations. He still has to deal with the temptations, but he is in control of them. That is what is represented by the sick man taking up his bed in which he had hitherto lain and walking. He's able to walk now before he could not. We recall what happens. The Jews see him carrying this bed, and so they say, Why are you carrying your bed? That is not permitted on the Sabbath. And our Lord told him to do so, and so he explains this. And then uh, when our Lord later sees him in the temple, uh, in verse 14, we see that our Lord runs into him in the temple. He finds him in the temple. He says, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest some worse thing happen to thee. Now, that shows a couple of things. It shows that uh, sin can have a result of some physical infirmity. It doesn't mean that every physical infirmity is a result of one's personal sin. That's not the case. Some people are, that's their burden in life. That's their cross they have to carry. It's not their fault. Others, it is. it can be a punishment. And our Lord implies that. Our Lord says, sin no more, lest some worse thing happen to thee. But of course, worse than a physical infirmity of 38 years is being cast into hell. That is a worse thing that happens, worse than any physical malady. So uh, he is warning him of that, uh, that worse thing. But then the man goes his way and tells the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him whole. Now, St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, uh, and St. Euthymius, uh, the early church writer Euthymius, said that he was not betraying our Lord. He was not giving him away to the Jews. Sometimes people think that he's tattling on our Lord and you know he's reporting him to the Jews. But that's not why he did it, though. <clears throat> he knew they were looking for him. He knew that uh, they were trying to... Um, oppress our blessed Lord. But this man, by telling the Jews that our Lord was the one, that Jesus was the one who healed him, is giving glory to him. He's boldly professing. Remember, they, there was a time, and we're not sure exactly at what point that was here, but when anyone who would speak openly of Christ would be apprehended by the Jews. But this man now boldly goes forth and tells the Jews, it was Jesus of Nazareth who healed me. He's boldly professing his faith and being a bold witness uh, to our blessed Lord and his healing power. And it, uh, it was out of gratitude, as St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, and Euthymius say, out of gratitude. So what this shows then, what this becomes a semeon of, a sign of, is that it is a sign of that sacrament of confirmation. And kind of draw a connection between the sacrament of confirmation and this man's healing. Because consider, this man, he was under an infirmity, but he wasn't dead. He was falling short of the precepts of love of God and love of neighbor. He didn't arrive at the perfection of fulfillment of justice, but he was still alive. So it's not like he represented a man dead in, dead in sin, but he was weak. And so, like confirmation does, confirmote, as the bishop says, I confirm you, I strengthen you. That's what happens in the sacrament of confirmation. We receive strengthening. And we are able to profess our Lord boldly as soldiers of Christ. And so we can connect a line then from this sign to that outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace known as the sacrament of confirmation, which also 
helps perfect us, helps make us spiritually mature, and gives us the grace of being able to boldly profess our blessed Lord. So we saw those first two miracles that our blessed Lord performed, the healing of that person at the wedding feast, I'm, I'm sorry, first the transforming of the water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, John chapter 2. And then we also saw the healing of the ruler's son, which was a sign of the sacrament of, of extreme unction. And now we have this third one, the healing of the man at Bethsaida, and it's a sign of the sacrament of confirmation. So, what then uh, are we to make of uh, this whole Sabbath thing? We've talked about that a little bit. Uh, so remember what our blessed Lord uh, says. Now he, he, encounter, he encounters the Jews, they challenge him on this, and here's where we start to see the divinity of our Lord being stated by our most blessed Lord. And uh, it's a, that this chapter is very much a chapter of the divinity of our blessed Lord. Uh, some uh, heretics say that this must have been written later because... This is too divine, it's too theological, it's, it's too, it points too directly to the divinity of our Lord. That's not the case. It wasn't written later in the sense of people redacting the, the gospel and adding. There's just no proof of that. All the earliest copies of this have it. So this is something you're going to encounter with these, uh, these heretics, these scriptural heretics. They will say that oh, you know, these things were added into the Gospels later. So they say, yeah, you know that miracle there about the man at Bethsaida? And then our Lord's response saying, you know, he's equal to God. That wasn't in the original text. And you might ask, okay, well, which text is it missing from? Which, which actual documents do we have that don't have it? Oh, well, it's not missing from anyone. But believe me, it wasn't in the original one. It's nonsense. There's no evidence that it was not in the original. It is in all the texts we have extant of this gospel. And so here, uh, our Lord, as we'll see in a second, uh, he really sets forth his, his divinity. Let's take a look at how he responds then uh, to the Jews. Remember he says to them in uh, John chapter 5, verse 17, he says these words, My father worketh until now, and I work. Okay. So, he goes on to say, even further, My father worketh until now, and I work. Hereupon, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only did he break the Sabbath, but also said, God was his father, making himself equal to God. They knew the implications of our Lord's words. My father worketh until now, and I work. He's saying, I'm working on the Sabbath. It's almost like he's saying, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Obviously, he's not being so confrontational. But he is saying that he works until now, and my father works until now. St. Thomas Aquinas mentions that God did not cease from all of his works, as it were, on the Sabbath, but he ceased from the work of creation, new creation on the Sabbath. There was no more new creation on the Sabbath. But he does work in the sense that he preserves everything. In the same way, uh, the Greek word liturgia is work. That's what it means. It's the, it's the work of God. It's, it's the work that the, the, the priests do in giving honor and worship to Almighty God. That is a work on the Sabbath that is permitted. Servile work, unnecessary servile work, is forbidden on Sabbath and holy days. And so... Uh, that kind of work is forbidden, but the work of the liturgy is indeed uh, permitted and good to do on the Sabbath. By the way, as we go on, you can submit your questions that I will answer at the end of the class, and those you can submit those on Census Fidelium. Uh, you can ask those there, and I'll, I'll take those at the end of the class in case you have questions. Maybe I'll get some questions on uh, Sunday work or whatnot, so that seems to often crop up. So, he works, and uh, his father works uh, until now. So, now what about this, this idea of making himself uh, equal to God? 
he is indeed stating that he is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, our Lord uh, uh, answers uh, to them. He says this, Amen, amen, I say to you, the Son cannot do anything of himself but what he seeth the Father doing. For what things soever he, the Father, does, these the Son also does in like manner. Notice what he's saying. What things soever the Father does, these the Son also does in like manner. What things soever, anything whatsoever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. Can you see how that's a claim of divinity? You see how he is claiming to be God because he's saying whatever the Father does, the Son, I, the Son, also do in like manner. He's saying, I do all the things that God the Father does. That is a claim of divinity. And so, uh, St. Cyril kind of explains this in a certain way. Let's see how uh, he explains it. He says, they do likewise or work in like manner who are altogether of the same nature. So, our, explaining our Lord's words that uh, what things soever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. Saying to work in like manner means that they do this because they have the same nature. That's how they can work in like manner. As therefore He, the Son, is God of true God, He is able to do likewise the same things as the Father. So, you see how He is stating that he is working in the like manner that is in the same nature of, as God the Father. But our Lord makes it even more explicit. He says this in John chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. He says, Neither does the Father judge any man. How about that? God the Father is not going to judge, but he's given all judgment to the Son, all judgment to the Son, that all men may honor the Son as they honor, honor the Father. He is saying that He has rights to equal honor as the Father. And not only that, He's saying that that's why God has given, God the Father has given to the Son, our Lord Jesus, all judgment. It's our Lord who will come to judge us at the final judgment. Not the Father, the Son will judge us. He's given all judgment to the Son so that all men may honor the Son as they honor the Father, in the same way that they honor the Father. This is definitely putting himself on par with God the Father. It, it's, and he is not elevating himself. In fact, he's going to go on to talk about how his, uh, he has witness born of him. He says, if I bear witness to myself, that's nothing. But there is one that bears witness of me bears testimony of me, bears witness to the fact of what I'm saying, that it is uh, actually uh, true. So, uh, he says, uh, the Father loves the Son, verse 20, and shows him all things which he himself does, and greater works than these he will show him that you may wonder. So, what greater works is he going to do? St. Thomas Aquinas says, not just raise up a sick man, but later on, we will see he will raise up a dead man. And so these are the greater works that uh, he will do to show the fact of what he's saying that it is true. And he even states this explicitly in verse 21. He says, For as the Father raises up the dead and gives life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. We're going to see that he does so uh, to Lazarus, uh, pretty soon in, uh, I think it's uh, chapter 9. And then he says uh, that, yes, amen, amen, I say to you, that he who hears my word and believes him that sent me has life everlasting and comes not into judgment, but is passed from death to life. He who believes my word has passed from death to life. Again, another divine claim, because it is Almighty God who is the author of life. And so he says, he who hears my word, has passed from death to life. That can only mean that he speaks the words of God, that his own words are uh, divine. 
And now he says uh, a mysterious thing that we're going to delve into here. Let's take a look. In John chapter 5, verse 25. Amen, amen, I say unto you that the hour cometh. There's that hour, that minor theme. The hour cometh and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Okay, so this voice of God, we're going to see, we're going to delve into this a little bit because it's very important uh, what, to understand what does that mean? Who's the voice of God? What is the voice of God? If you remember, it's one of the major themes that we saw in this, um, in this gospel. Uh, the voice of God is indeed one of the seven basic major themes. The voice of God. And so, the voice of God, then, is that which is spoken by Almighty God, that which comes forth from the mouth of God. Uh, there's a big hint I'm going to give you because of the iconography that often depicts this. This is an image of the voice of God. So, you see how in this image, the Holy Ghost is proceeding from the mouth of both the Father and the Son. The Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and the Son. This is the voice of God. Now, I can make that claim, but let's take a look in the sacred scripture to show how it is true. First, we have to go back into the Old Testament, and we're going to see a number of examples. There are multiple ones we can choose, but I'm going to choose out some of them. I can perhaps name a few others if you want to delve further into it. But this, this image of the voice of God is a beautiful one, and we're going to see how sacred scripture speaks of it. So, in Wisdom chapter 1, verse 7, he says, The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord hath filled the whole world, and that which containeth all things hath knowledge of the voice. The Spirit of the Lord. Notice the connection between the Spirit of the Lord and the voice. <clears throat> Again, here's another uh, more simple um, illuminate from a missile. You see how the Holy Ghost here is coming forth from the mouth of the Son, from the mouth of the Father. He is spirated, as we say in theology. The, uh, the Holy Ghost proceeds forth as like the breath of God. He is spirated. He is breathed forth. Um, we say that spiration because this is an, an act of the will. It's not just coming forth. It's not coming forth from the act of the intellect. Our Lord proceeds from the Father by means of the intellect of the Father. He is uh, begotten, not made. As an idea is conceived, is begotten, and proceeds then in, uh, in, in, from the mind of the Father, from the intellect of the Father, so the Holy Ghost proceeds from the will of the Father and the Son. There's only one will in God. He proceeds forth from the will of both, to the one will, with the one will of God. Um, and so this is a breathing force. There's a will, there's a voluntas, a, a will involved in this. And so, uh, to, to breathe forth this idea, or to speak this idea, is to spirate the Holy Ghost. This idea of the Word, spoken by the voice, which is the Holy Ghost. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's take a look at some other places in sacred scripture where we see uh, about the Holy Ghost and, and the connection to speaking the voice of God. Well, here's an here is in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 10, verse 20. It shall be given to you in that hour what to speak. For it is not you that speak, <clears throat> but the Spirit of your Father that speaketh in you. Who does the speaking for God? The Spirit. That is the voice of God. Let's look at another passage. Back to the Old Testament, Judith, chapter 16, verse 17. The praise of God at the very end of the book of Judith. Let all thy creatures serve thee because thou hast spoken and they were made. Thou didst send forth thy spirit and they were created and there is no one that can resist thy voice. See the connection between the speaking, the spirit, and the voice. The spirit is the voice of God. Let's take a look at another one all the way back to the end of the Bible in the book of the Apocalypse. St. John writes, And I heard a voice 
a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From henceforth now saith the Spirit that they may rest from their labors, for their works follow them. This is from the Requiem Mass. Uh, but notice, I heard a voice from heaven. And who's doing the speaking? The Spirit. That's the voice of God. Let's take a look again at something else in the New Testament in the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 10. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the Spirit that spoke. Let's go once more back to the Old Testament. They made their heart as at the adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts sent in His Spirit. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 12. And also, finally, we'll take a look at one more. This from Corinthians. For he that speaketh in a tongue, by the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. He that speaketh in a tongue, by the Spirit he speaketh. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. So, this voice of God, then, is the, this speaking, uh, you might say, of the Father and the Son. It's not just in one icon or in this another illuminate from a missal. Uh, there's a famous work by, I think his name is Quarton, I think is his name, uh, I think a French uh, artist, and from the 16th century, and he has this uh, beautiful image. Let's take a look at that. Uh, here's the crowning of the Blessed Virgin Mary after the Assumption in heaven. And notice the Holy Ghost between the Father and the Son. Notice how the, the, the two, the Father and the Son, are, they're identical. One doesn't look older than the other. Because our Lord says, He who sees me sees the Father. And notice how the, the wings are touching the mouth of the one and the mouth of the other, speaking as if we're breathing forth, spirating forth the Holy Spirit, the voice of God. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is the, the voice of God. Th there's another image that uh, we can, by which we can see that the Holy Ghost uh, is uh, this voice of God. And the reason why I'm going into this more and more is because you're going to see these images come up multiple times. So I don't want you to just have what you need for the Gospel of St. John, but I also want you to be able to look into sacred scripture and see these images and see what those images are actually pointing towards. So when you're reading the Old Testament, like when you happen to be reading Zechariah, uh, or you happen to be reading uh, Isaiah, or you're reading the book of the Apocalypse, and you see these images, then you'll be able to see, ah, that's what's going on. This is, uh, this is the connection that is being made. And so the image then of the voice of God is spoken of like water. What does that voice sound like? It is as the sound of many waters. Let's see what it says in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, there's this passage, Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 2. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came in by way of the east, and his voice was like the noise of many waters. I'm going to see why that's significant in a moment. There's also another passage in Ezekiel uh, at the beginning of the book, uh, chapter uh, 1, verse uh, 24, I think it is. And also it's spoken of, the, the voice of the Lord is spoken of as the noise of many waters, the sound of, of many waters. We also see this in the Psalms. Let's take a look. Psalm 28, verse 3. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of majesty hath thundered. The Lord is upon many waters. So the voice of the Lord upon the waters the voice of the Lord over the waters. Does that sound familiar? It should, right? From Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Spirit of God moved over the waters. Again, you see the connection there with the voice of the Lord and the Spirit of God upon the waters, over the waters. The Spirit of God is, and the voice of God is, has this connection with waters in some way. We also see this in uh, some other writings, not just in Psalms, not just in uh, 
uh, Ezekiel, the prophet, yet another prophet speaks of this, and it's the prophet Isaiah. Let's take a look. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 14 and 15. For the house is forsaken until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high. Now, you're going to see that a number of times. It's not just in the Old Testament, it's in the New. Let's take a look at St. Paul. In his letter to Titus, chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, this is a great proof text, by the way, for, uh, for baptism. He saved us by the laver, or washing, if you, you know, what does laver mean? <laughs> washing. By the laver, the washing of regeneration. What does regeneration mean? It means being born again. Regeneration. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renovation of the Holy Ghost, whom He hath poured forth upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Holy Ghost is poured forth upon us. When is the Holy Ghost poured forth upon us? Well, for that, I'm going to answer that by... Put on my apologetics hat for this one, because this is an apologetics issue, and this is an important apologetics text. Titus 3, verse 5. You can also remember this easily because it connects back to John 3, verse 5. You remember John 3, verse 5? If you remember that, that's when our Lord says, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a man be born, just like Titus 3, 5, born of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. To be born again is to be born in baptism. That's what the Catholic believes. That's the truth. That's what Scripture says. The renovation of the Holy Ghost, which also saves you. I know there are Protestants that don't believe that, but let's take a look at what the Bible says. He saved us by the washing of regeneration, being born again, and the renovation of the Holy Ghost, whom He hath poured forth, poured forth upon us abundantly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He hath saved us. So uh, that's worth uh, delving into uh, just a little bit more because I love apologetics and I hope you do too. And I hope you, uh, you pick up a few things here. huh? So uh, he says, uh, he has poured forth the Holy Ghost upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by His grace, that's what happens at baptism, justification, by His grace, we may be heirs according to hope of life everlasting. We inherit life everlasting. That's all of what we see in the, in the Roman Catechism as to the effects of baptism. Grace of God, justification, heirs to eternal life. Renovation of the Holy Ghost, poured forth, we receive the Holy Ghost at baptism. We begin to have that indwelling of the Holy Ghost by sanctifying grace, this created participation and share in the life of God. That's what happens at baptism, and it's right there in sacred scripture. And He saved us. So, when someone says, oh, I've been saved because I accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, I would say, that's not what scripture says. Scripture says He saves us by the washing of regeneration, by the Holy Ghost being poured forth upon us. The waters of baptism poured forth as we do uh, when one is uh, baptized. Um, there are more passages we can uh, look at. I uh, wasn't planning on going into this, but why not? It's there. It's in front of us. Let's take a look. He says, you are filled in him. This is Colossians 2, verse 10 through 12. You are filled in him who is the head of all principality and power, in whom you are circumcised with the circumcision not made by hand in the despoiling of the body of the flesh, but in the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. And that's why we baptize infants as Catholics, because it's the circumcision of Christ. According to the Bible, it is. It's the circumcision of Christ, and at what age was circumcision conferred? As a baby. That's when you entered into the Old Covenant. Why does my act of the will have to be present in order for me to enter into the Old Covenant? Are you saying that my salvation is dependent upon my act of the will? Well, obviously there can't be any obstacle in the will for us to receive salvation, but there's no obstacle in the will in a little baby. 
as an adult, we do have to have the, the will to receive this, right? So you do have to be willing to accept salvation, but it's received. It happens at the moment of uh, baptism. Uh, and yet another uh, apologetics point that we want to bring out is uh, 1 Peter also speaks about salvation coming through baptism. It says that on the on the uh, ark in the flood with Noah, it says eight souls were saved by water, whereunto baptism, being of the like form, now saves you also. That from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Saved by water, whereunto baptism, being of the like form, now saves you. So you ask someone, what saves you? You, know, what is, you ask a person who's perhaps uh, not Catholic, but believes in Christ, what is it that saves you? Is it your accepting Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Maybe, yeah, that's it. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says baptism saves you, according to 1 Peter 3, verse 20 and 21. So, as I said, I wasn't planning on going into those apologetics points, but I really like apologetics, and so it's kind of fun to cover those things and see how uh, the Catholic Church is right there. It's just coming out of sacred scripture. It's right there. Okay, the other aspect of the voice of God, again, this is an important point because the voice of God, we're going to see this coming up, and um, <clears throat> we're going to see this used throughout scripture, as you'll see in just a second. But the voice of God is connected not only with water, but quite curiously, the opposite, with fire. We see that all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. Let's take a look there. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 33. Ask of the days of old, if ever there was done the like thing, or if, if it hath been known at any time that a people should hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of fire, as thou hast heard and lived. There's another passage. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 26. What is all flesh that it should hear the voice of the living God, who speaketh out of the midst of the fire, as we have heard, and be able to live? So what exactly is Moses talking about here? And yes, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Deuteronomy included. What is he talking about? What's the fire speaking out of the midst? That's that pillar of fire that hovered over the altar, and it was a representation of of the Holy Ghost, it's a representation of the Spirit. And God spoke, the voice of God came forth from the midst of the fire. So how do we know that that fire is connected with the Spirit? Well, let's go to the book of the Acts of the Apostles for that. Acts chapter 2, verse 2 through 4. On Pentecost Sunday, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty wind or Ruah in the Hebrew, or Panuma in the Greek, spirit, also, same word, wind, Panuma, Ruah, spirit, wind, it's the same thing. A mighty wind coming, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them parted tongues, as it were, of fire. And it sat upon every one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak. Now the voice of God is speaking speaking in them. So this is uh, what is represented, represented by the fire. So the fire is a representation of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost speaking, the sound that comes upon the apostles, the voice of God. So it's a beautiful, beautiful image. Okay, so let's get back to those themes of the gospel we're going to see in just a second. Uh, the idea of uh, the witness, okay? So, if you jump back, uh, we'll turn away from 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll jump back to John chapter 5. And he repeats again in verse 27 that he is given power to do judgment to the Son of God, right? The Son of Man, right? He's given him power to do judgment. And then he says, wonder not at this. Again, he repeats this hour and the voice of God again. He says, wonder not at this, for the hour cometh wherein all that are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of God. 
and uh, shall be raised up. We, we actually see this in uh, John chapter 11. I recall this. It's uh, chapter uh, 11 where uh, Lazarus is raised, uh, raised to life. And so, uh, it, you know, the Spirit restores him to life by the voice of the Son of God. And then he says, They that have done good things shall come forth unto the resurrection of life, but they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. I think I'm going to put up my apologetics hat on the, for this one as well. They that have done good things shall come forth unto the resurrection of life, but they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. He doesn't say, Those who have accepted me as my personal Lord and Savior, uh, or those who have faith simply, yes, we have to have faith, but those who have done good things, shall come forth unto the resurrection of life. Those that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. Okay? So, we're not saying that we earn our salvation by ourselves. We're not saying that a man's just simple good works can earn him salvation. We're not saying that. But, good works are necessary. And our Lord makes our salvation contingent upon that. It's God's grace that saves us. Okay? It's a free gift. Right? It's not something that we have as it were, earned. However, once you're in the state of grace, you can merit further grace. You can earn further grace because you have the principle of grace in you. As Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling for God is at work in you, both willing and doing to accomplish unto his purpose. So yes, we work our salvation because God is in us. Because God is doing the works in us in the state of grace. Notice what our Lord says. Those that do good works, resurrection of life. Those that have done evil, resurrection of judgment. If you have an issue with that, take it up with our Lord. That's, I'm, just, uh, uh, I'm just giving you what's there in sacred scripture. Uh, and as uh, properly interpreted. We could also go to Romans chapter 2, verse 6 and following to see that as well. But this isn't really an apologetics class, so we're going to go back to, uh, to sacred scripture. Okay and to John chapter 5. So here again we're going to see this issue of testimony, this theme of testimony. Uh, you remember that's one of the themes, one of the major themes. Uh, now we, it comes on to the scene uh, once again. Witness or testimony. So uh, our Lord says this in John chapter 5 verse 31 and 32. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There's another that bears beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Now, the word witness that's given there is he martyria in the Greek. He martyria, witness or testimony. Sometimes you'll see it rendered as testimony, but if you look at the Greek, it's martyria. Martyria. Do you know this little root word in English cognate that we get from martyria? Obviously, the word martyr. For a martyr is one who gives witness. He gives witness with his blood. He gives witness with his life. Now, originally it didn't mean witness, meaning with your blood. That's not what it meant. It just meant giving witness. He gives witness. But it became connected with those who had given this kind of witness with their blood. And so now in English, we, when we hear martyr, we think of someone who has actually shed his blood, given his life, uh, for our blessed Lord. But that's where it comes from. Witness or testimony. When you see that, he has given witness to witness of me. He has given testimony of me. In the Greek, it's the same word that's being used. It's just expressed a little bit differently in the English, but it's the same concept. Giving witness. What does a witness give? Testimony in a court of law, right? That's It's the same thing. Martyria. And so... Uh, that this giving of, of witness, uh, you'll see this, it, it, comes, it comes a number of times, you know, not just in verses 31 and 32. He, he goes on on this issue. You, you sent to John, but he gives testimony to the truth, right? He gives testimony to the truth. But I receive not the testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. <laughs> He's connecting himself with salvation, another sort of divine implication. And then speaking of John, he was a burning and shining light. Remember that theme of light that we see in, uh, that we started with in the first chapter? 
uh, that John was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light, because there's Jews that went out to John. He says, but I have a greater testimony, a greater martyria, a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to perfect the works themselves which I do give testimony of me. So what is it that's giving testimony uh, to our blessed Lord? It is these works of His. That's what give testimony. And that's why our Lord says, if I don't do the works of my Father, do not believe me. Because yes, anyone could come in, in walking as in the form of man who has taken on a human nature and say, I am God. But if, unless he proves it, unless the man proves it, then you know, how, what's the witness? What's the testimony? Who's, who's backing up? What is backing up what you're saying? And our Lord backed up what he was saying by the miracles, by the Simeon, by the signs that our Lord showed. But not only that, of course, you have the prophecies which pointed to our blessed Lord, to his time of coming, you know, this, this uh, 490, 490th year uh, from the edict that went forth to the, for the rebuilding of the temple, as is spoken of by the prophet Daniel. That was the time that our Lord came. It was right at that time. They knew they were expecting the Messiah at that time. And... Now he goes a little further. Now he talks about the sacred scriptures. So this is uh, an interesting passage. Let's, let's take a look at what he says. Search the scriptures, for you think in them to have life everlasting. The same are they that give testimony of me. Wow, what a bold claim. The scriptures give testimony of me, is what our blessed Lord is saying. They are giving testimony of our Lord Jesus. That's what the scriptures give testimony of. And you will not come to me that you may have life. He's saying, unless you come to me, he's implying, unless you come to him, we don't have life. And the scriptures give testimony to Christ. That's what they bear witness to. But you know, he finishes this idea. And again, you remember I said Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. I'm not just saying that, and you know, the, you have these people that deny that because they're just heretics, but uh, at any rate, our Lord said it. Take a look. John chapter 5, verse 46 to 47. If you did believe Moses, you would perhaps believe me also, for he wrote of me. Moses wrote of him. But if you will not believe his writings, Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? Our Lord himself is bearing testimony that it was indeed Moses that wrote uh, the scriptures, as he says, okay? And he's speaking of those first five books. Obviously, there could be details that were completed, like the, the death of Moses, completed perhaps by Joshua, filling in the moment that he died, as you find at the end of uh, Deuteronomy. But, uh, you know... So, but that means the, the but the substance of the book, the entire the the, uh, the the major part of the book is written by uh, by Moses. Um, so he wrote of me. Okay, let's take a look at where we've where we've been, and let's take a look at these themes once again. So remember, we saw these seven basic themes, uh, and notice how many of them came out here, huh? We see we saw the voice of God. The idea of testimony and that, as he said in verse 32, John bore testimony and his witness of me is true. St. John gave testimony to the truth, as he says in verse uh, 33. We also see, I didn't mention it earlier, but that image of light actually comes out again, that John was a burning and shining light. I mean, just, just, just touched upon it. We saw that image of the voice of God show up a number of times. And then we also saw the hour spoken of, right? The hour. We're, we're going to go into more detail on the, the hour uh, later on. We also saw some of the minor themes there. Well, the seven sacraments. We saw that, uh, that second, I'm sorry, the third miracle that our blessed Lord performed of the healing of the man at Bethsaida as the uh, sign of the Sacrament of Confirmation. 
So, uh, okay, I am going to take some questions now. Uh, and then if you have any, we can uh, answer those. I'll do my best to answer those. So let's see if we have any questions. So, and as you continue to read this book, by the way, I also said I was going to give you some other additional verses if you want to delve a little bit more into this issue of the voice. It was something our Lord actually mentioned earlier as well. Uh, we just briefly touched upon it in John chapter 3, verse 8. Do you remember he said uh, that the Spirit breatheth, breathes where he will, and thou hearest his voice, Right? But thou knowest not whence he cometh and whither he goes, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Again, our Lord making a connection between the Spirit and the voice of God. It's a beautiful meditation, by the way. If you want reflection on the voice of God and what does the voice carry, well, the voice brings the truth, brings the Word. That's why it was the Spirit that hovered over the Blessed Mother when our Lord was conceived. So it's the, the, this voice the, 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 that carries the Word. Um, there was also another uh, passage I wanted to give you. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 2, speaks also of this, the voice of God, the, vo the Spirit, voice of the Lord. Uh, I mentioned Zechariah chapter 7, verse 12. And uh, we also see that in Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse 17, it says, The sword of the Spirit is the Word. So you can kind of see this connection between the sword of the Spirit is the Word. So what does the Spirit strike with? The Word. How does that Word go forth? The voice. So it's, it's by the Spirit that the Word of, of God comes forth. I didn't mention into too, go into too much detail on this as well, but we mentioned how the, the water connected with the Spirit. The Spirit hovered over the waters. We mentioned the fire in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 33, uh, but also the air. Uh, in Genesis 3, verse 8, says that uh, the Lord came walking in the afternoon air, this breath of God. Penuma, breath, in the Hebrew it's ruah, uh, that is uh, the word for spirit as well. So this breath of God, there's air, water and fire connected with the Spirit. Elements that we need for life huh? shows how the Spirit is uh, indeed necessary for our spiritual life. Now, obviously the elements of water, fire, and the air, I'm not saying that the Spirit is in those as in some sort of, you know, uh, pantheistic sort of way. I'm not a follower of Spinoza or these other uh, bad philosophers. Uh, but no, it is, they are representative of what the Spirit does. You know, just as fire gives light, it gives heat, warmth. In a certain sense, you have the fire of life in you, or the warmth of your body, as it were. Water gives life, air gives life, so also the Spirit gives life. And just like air, we're surrounded with air, but we can't see it, so also the Spirit is everywhere, and we can't see Him. Water, in a certain sense, in a certain sense, you can't. See, you see the reflection off the water, but in a sense, it's colorless. You can see through it, but it is present there nonetheless. Uh, obviously, it's not invisible, but... And also, uh, we see in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8, that the Spirit, uh, uh, by the Spirit, we are given the Word. That's what St. Paul says, by the Spirit, we are given the Word. Again, so that's the voice that brings the Word to us. Okay, so let's get to some questions. A couple of questions here. Okay, very good question, an apologetics one as well. And I love these. Okay, so in regards to the Son being equal to the Father, how do we reconcile that with our Lord saying that the Father is greater than I? So you're speaking of the passage during the Last Supper when our blessed Lord says in uh, John chapter 14, uh, verse 28, where he says, I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. John chapter 14, verse uh, 28. But you know, of course the Father is greater than him in that he is originless. The Father is originless, as opposed to the Son who has his origin in the Father. The Son is not originless, right? He is uh, 
he proceeds uh, from the Father, and so he has his origin in the Father, but the Father doesn't proceed from anyone else. So it is a greater thing, as it were, to be originless than to you know, be dependent on another for your existence, as it were. But in saying so, of course, there is still an equality, right? Because there are other passages in that same, uh, in that same uh, Last Supper discourse, and also uh, in uh, Colossians that, that we can show you in a second, in Philippians as well, uh, that show our Lord's equality with the Father. So He's greater, yes, the Father is greater than Him, uh, because the Father is what we say notionally prior to the Son. I don't mean temporally, I'm not a heretic, right? So we don't mean that the Father uh, existed in some moment of time before the Son existed. That's not what we believe. But notionally prior, in other words, for, you start with the Father. You have to start with the Father. The Father was. The Father existed. And proceeding from the Father, from all eternity, was the Son. But you had to start with the Father. Notionally, right? Notionally prior. And to, in, other, in, other words, in other words, to be prior, which is why He's Father, which is why we call the Son, Son, to be prior is greater. But it doesn't mean that there's an inequality in who they are, in their personhood. Notice uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, where it's, he says, He thought not equality uh, with God something to be grasped onto, right? Something to be uh, grasped at or, you know, so... He, equality with God. He has equality with God, but he didn't deem it something that had to be held to, grasped onto, like, like you know, white knuckle grip on the thing. He says, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. So St. Paul in Philippians 2 verse 5 simply states that he's equal to God. He, says, he, he didn't have that equality. He didn't, I'm sorry, I'm, let me rephrase that. He didn't think that his equality with God was something to be held to, but he emptied himself in taking on the form of a slave, in taking on a human nature is what he means. And when we say emptied himself, we don't mean that he denatured himself. He still had the divine nature, but emptied in the sense of, to our eyes, this just looked like a man. This man walking in Palestine first looks like a man. He doesn't first look like God. It's only at moments like the transfiguration that that divinity started to shine forth. Uh, we also uh, saw in uh, John 5, uh, 18, where that he made himself equal to God. We're also going to see, so sign of coming attractions, we're going to see in uh, John uh, chapter 8, verse uh, 58, I think it is, yes, where uh, he says uh, he pre-exists Abraham, and we say, what are you talking about? And then Jesus says to them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, before Abraham was made, I am. He takes the divine name to himself. So yeah, that shows equality with God. He just took God's name, applying it to himself. We're also going to see in John chapter 16, verse 15, where he says, All things whatsoever the Father has are mine. Our blessed Lord. It's a quote from him. All things whatsoever the Father has are mine. Does the Father have divinity? Yes, of course. All things whatsoever the Father has are mine, says the Son in John chapter 16, verse 15. We also see in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, where we see that in Christ, all the fullness of of the divinity dwells corporally. All the fullness of the divinity dwells corporally. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 uh, verse 9. Let's take a look at that passage. It's an important point because you get people that deny the divinity of our Lord or you get uh, there's some people like the Seventh-day Adventists or Jehovah's Witnesses who don't exactly put our blessed Lord on par with God the Father. Um, I'll have to tell you a story about that one time, about their using their scripture to show how that's not true. Uh, so, 
Um, where am I looking at here? Okay, here it is. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. In Him, that is in Christ, he's speaking about Christ. In Christ, all the fullness of the divinity, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells corporally in the body. The Word was made flesh. The divinity, God, was made flesh. The Word was God. Remember we saw that right at the beginning? So that's another way you can show that. Okay. And uh, it says that in Hebrews chapter uh, 2, verse 8, He was made lower than the angels, but by that we mean He was put into a place that was lower than the angels by having a human nature, by taking on a human nature. Right? But in that very passage in Hebrews chapter 2, he says, But to which of the angels have we ever said this? You know, he says, God has not subjected unto angels the world to come, but Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, so that he could have a body and uh, suffer, therefore. Um, and it says, by Him, this is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, by Him, by Christ, all things are, and by whom are all things. So, let me back up and just read it. For it became Him, Christ Jesus, for whom all things are, and by whom all things are. For all things are for Christ, all things are by Christ. To perfect the author of their salvation by his passion. Christ Jesus was the one who suffered the passion. In the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, uh, it says this. Remember, and so this is also, here we go. Let's put this apologetics hat back on because this is uh, an issue uh, regarding the angels. And remember that whole thing of, is our Lord St. Michael the archangel? You know, I think Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. Take a, have, have them take a look at... Hebrews chapter 1, <clears throat> where it says, uh, God has spoken to us by His Son, by whom He made the world. So Christ made this, the, uh, the world. Um, God made the world through Christ, by whom. And it says that Christ is the figure, visible figure, of His substance. Christ is the figure of God's substance. God's substance, that means God's essence. He's the visible sign of God's essence. Being made so much better than the angels. Our Lord is not an angel. He's made better than the angels. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, For to which of the angels has he said at any time, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Again, I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. He goes on in verse 6 to say, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God adore him. You adore no one but God. And he says, Let all the angels adore Christ, including St. Michael. Our Lord is not St. Michael. Okay. They're just confusing something uh, from uh, Daniel the prophet. And they're getting the two confused. He speaks of Michael and he speaks of the prince. He says, none hath been the prince, the leader, the ruler. None hath been his helper except Michael. So Michael helped him out because Michael was the one who stood up and said, who is like unto God? Right, we know that story of St. Michael. Okay. Anyway, that's the long answer to that question, but I think it's an important question. Okay. Uh, another question, why did I choose the Gospel of John in particular? Because I love this Gospel for one. Uh, it is the loftiest Gospel. It's the one whose symbol, the author's symbol, is the eagle uh, because it soars above the others. The keenness of the insight, the depth. Th this, is, this is a very prayerful Gospel. They had already written the three synoptic Gospels. That is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the synoptic Gospels. Those had already been written, and then the, the uh, disciples of St. John in his older age, they asked him, will you write a gospel of things that were left out? I don't know if they actually asked that, but 
That's what John said. That's what St. John said he would write, those things that were left out. That's why it's different from the synoptics, because there are things he left out. So of course there are things he doesn't mention that happen in the synoptics, but he doesn't include because he's trying to fill in and give a theological insight into our Lord's life as well. I mean, he's relating facts, but he's relating them in a way that helps us connect those theological dots. That's why I love this gospel uh, so much. And it was St. John that rested his head on the breast of our blessed Lord. He is the, the archetype for the priest, as it were. I mean, Christ is really the archetype, but, it, but it's of the creatures who are also priests in the New Testament. St. John is the one so close to our blessed Lord that priests really should emulate, imitate. So that's why I chose this gospel. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, there are some other questions uh, not exactly related to St. John's Gospel. That's okay. I'll take the ones that I can. Uh, so let's see. Protestants say they are covered by the blood of Christ. Is this different from Catholics? Um, we often, you, you often won't hear that kind of terminology but we do believe that, right? We, you know, we ask the precious blood. In fact, there's an invocation. There's an ejaculatory prayer. Precious blood of Jesus, wash over me. We want to be covered with the blood of our blessed Lord. Um, you know, so there's the sprinkling of the blood. Uh, but often, it's you know, Catholics don't use that. It, that that's kind of a cultural fr uh, phrasing. So interestingly enough, Protestants have their traditions. This is this is one of them, the way they express things. You know. So it's nothing wrong with it. It's just, you know, we just, often Catholics don't use that kind of parlance. Uh, they'll just use other expressions. But um, so how that blood gets applied to us, we would say, is different. We believe there's baptism, okay? But then also if, God forbid, one has the, the horrible uh, misfortune of falling into the state of mortal sin, we recover that state of grace by the blood of our Lord being applied to us through the sacrament of penance, confession of sins to a priest. As we see in St. John's Gospel, in John chapter 20, verse 19 through 23, we see uh, the confession of sins. Okay. Can prayers for the dead be effective for people who have died, say, 20 years ago? Yes, of course. They can be and they should be offered up. Right? Each man's works will be tried through fire, as it says in 1 Corinthians 3.13, each man's works will be tried through fire to see of what sort it is. If it's made of metal, strong metal, like you know, silver, gold, it will last. If, it's, if his works be stubble, hay, you know, wood, the, that will get burned up, but the, that which is metal will be purified. That's speaking of purgatory. That's actually a reference to purgatory, as St. Augustine said, commenting on that very passage, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 and following. So, we don't know how long people have to spend in purgatory, how much sin they have to expiate, how much temporal punishment is due to the sin. The question sort of is implying, well, we don't know how long they're there, but also, can it help someone who, whose fate was sealed, as it were, 20 years ago? Well, that fate may be that the person lit, died, uh, and I'm using that term fate in a loose way, of course. The person died in the state of grace, but needs to be purged of faults. That's what purgatory is for. For people that die in the state of grace. So prayers for someone who does not die in the state of grace, someone who died in the state of mortal sin, prayers can't help that person. Whether they died 20 years ago or a day ago. If they die in the state of mortal sin, prayers cannot help that person because that person is in hell for eternity, unfortunately. Um, that's just the reality. But for souls that die in the state of grace, but they need to purge away venial sins that were not repented of, or maybe confessed mortal sins that weren't fully expiated. You know, maybe they never went back. Maybe they felt bad. They confessed that sin, but they never made amends with that person as they should have. Or maybe they did make amends a little bit, but they really should have done more. That's the kind of thing that is made up for in purgatory because we need to be clean before going into the presence of Almighty God. As Apocalypse chapter 21 says, 
nothing unclean shall enter into the heavenly uh, Jerusalem, the, I mean, the, the kingdom of heaven. Um, we see that in Apocalypse uh, 21, verse 27, I believe. Yes, there shall not enter into it anything defiled into this heavenly Jerusalem. There shall not enter into it anything defiled. Apocalypse 21, verse 27. So, those, those defilements that we might die with, that is venial sin, I'm not talking about mortal sin, obviously that, you don't go to purgatory for mortal sin. But if a person dies with that, you can still help them. We don't know how long people are there. There are people, it's, you know, people will come back and this is, now this is private revelation, okay, so I just want to make that distinction here. But there's word where people will have, you know, been told, like for example, the children at Fatima were told by Our Lady, approved vision of Our Lady, that this one girl would be in purgatory to the end of time. There's, uh, so we just don't know how long the person uh, has, has to serve in that prison, as it were, in uh, purgatory. And it is spoken of as, uh, as a uh, prison. The Greek word is uh, phulake. It's a funny word, but phulake, that's the word for prison. It's spoken of in uh, First Peter, if I'm recalling correctly, and he talks about being in this uh, in this prison. Yes, First Peter three verse nineteen, where our Lord spoke to those spirits that were in prison, Fulake. And it's actually the same word that he used in Matthew uh, chapter five verse twenty five, where our Lord says, "Be uh, make peace with your adversary on your way to the judge, lest he cast you into." Fulake prison, and you be there till you pay the last farthing. That's purgatory. We pay the last farthing in that prison. Okay. So you want those people released from that prison, so please pray for them. Okay. Can our prayers help with someone else's particular judgment? Well, they're judged with what they have at the moment. Your prayers can help beforehand. You know, that they may have had a good uh, particular uh, judgment or pray that when they go before the, our blessed Lord for their particular judgment that, um, that they're in a state of grace you know, and, and that uh, they are repentant of all their sins. Okay. Oh, okay. Another question. Kind of off topic, but, uh, but that's okay because uh, I should clarify what I'm doing. Does blessing through online live broadcasting work? So, I want to clarify. When I give a blessing at the end, I'm blessing, my intention is to bless all those who will see this. The blessing doesn't go through the telecommunication networks or something like that. It's actually going straight to those people, okay, whoever's going to see this, okay, so whether you see it live or you know, whatnot, but it's going straight to the, it's not going through the camera or anything like that, okay, so, uh, so it's not like I'm blessing through that. But I can bless someone at a distance, right? You even speak, you hear of exorcists saying of doing exorcisms at a distance, right? Uh, there was even word that Pope Pius XII did an exorcism at a distance during Nazi Germany time because of all the th horrible things that were going on. He tried to do an exorcism of those evil characters in Nazi Germany from a distance. But okay, so blessings can work from uh, a distance, and that's what I'm doing when I give you a blessing. It's not actually going through phone lines or anything like that. Okay. Okay. Does, did God know us individually for all eternity? Yes. Does God know all things? Yes, God knows all things. Baltimore Catechism. God knew us individually for all eternity. He knew you. From the womb, He knew you. Before you were in the womb, He knew you. He knew at what point in time you would live. He knew at what point in time He would place you. He would create you. That's why you shouldn't wish you, you lived in any other time except right now. God has placed you perfectly for the time that you have today. I don't wish I were in another time. I, am, I will to be in this time. I don't understand all, this things, all the things of this time. But God has put me here at this time Therefore, that's what I will. Why would I will something that he doesn't will? He's obviously willed me to be alive in this time. Then that's what I will. Okay? But God knew you individually, 
personally for all eternity. He thought of you on the cross. He, he created you. He's the only one who knew of your existence at one point. Consider it. Even before your parents knew you were around, those very early days, our Lord knew and was forming you silently before your mother had any knowledge of what was going on. God was forming you. God knows each one of us individually because He knows all things and He loves us tremendously. He would have gone through the whole passion to show us that. If there was just one soul, if you were the only soul, He would have gone through that whole passion for you. Is it necessary to learn Latin? Why not just learn Greek and Hebrew only? He seems to, re to reference ancient Greek in word etymology more when explaining biblical meaning of the word. Uh, I think it is helpful to, is it necessary to learn Latin? I mean, it's not necessary to your salvation to learn Latin. It's not necessary to your salvation to learn Greek or Hebrew. If the question is more about why do you even bother with Latin when you have Greek and Hebrew? Well, for one, we, uh, we know that um, St. Jerome, well, we'll get to St. Jerome in a second. Let's go right to our Lord, huh? There were three languages that our blessed Lord used to proclaim Him as King when no one else would. In John chapter 19, uh, verse 17, I believe it is, we see word of what the title was uh, over our Lord's head. John chapter 19, uh, verse 19, I'm sorry. Pilate wrote a title also. He put it on the cross, a title, a placard. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum. This title, therefore, many of the Jews read because the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. Those were the three languages that God chose to proclaim Christ as King when no one else would. Those are those three languages that we preserve in the Latin Mass that I think are a beautiful title, beautiful placard, beautiful representation of what was going on on the cross right beneath the very placard. And that's why, by the way, you know when you see on the uh, crucifixes, if you, I'm not sure if the question is coming from someone who has a crucifix in his home, but it says I-N-R-I, okay? That's actually Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum. In Latin, there's no J, really. Uh, J would be written as an I in some times of the use of Latin. And so it's I-N-R-I. There can be a J in Latin, but I'm just generally speaking. That's why you see that. It's Latin. That The I-N-R-I is actually the Latin initials for what was written. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now, why the Latin? Okay, Latin became such a widespread language. It was the, it was the common language. It was the vulgar language. It was the common language. That's why we talk about the Latin Vulgate. It was the vulgar language. We don't, and we don't mean vulgar as in like impure. Now that word vulgar just means impure or something like that, base, but what it can also mean is common. The Latin Vulgate was the common language. It put the Bible in an accessible language instead of the obscure Hebrew or the obscure Greek. It was in a language that's accessible and it's one that's still very accessible to us today. Not a lot of Greek words that we use necessarily every day but there are a lot of Latin words, a lot of our language, I don't know, 40%, I'm not sure how many, what percentage of English comes from Latin, uh, you know, so it explains a lot of our English language, and it gives us that special prayer language as well. There's a lot, by the way, that can be cross-referenced when you have these sources, like for example, I mentioned St. Jerome earlier, I'll, I'll explain why. So when he put the Bible into the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, he had access to Hebrew and Greek texts that we don't have access to today. And he put them, he codified them in this text, you know, a, a copy that incorporated all those copies that were out there because there were Greek copies of the Bible. There were Hebrew copies of the Bible. Our Lord quoted from Greek 
copies of the Bible. St. Paul quoted from Greek copies of the Bible. So just to reject you know, books of the Bible from the Old Testament because they were not written in Hebrew does not make sense. But at any rate, uh, that's, that's more an issue of the Septuagint and whatnot and the, the seven additional books that Catholics have in the Bible uh, that are not in Hebrew. Uh, however, uh, the fact that St. Jerome preserved then these texts, which he had access to living in Bethlehem, having learned Hebrew from rabbis in Bethlehem, he was able to really capture the meaning well. Both of the, you know, because you might say the, the, uh, uh, the way the Bible was passed on for centuries before our Lord was both through the Hebrew tradition, we call it the Masoretic text, and through the Greek tradition, the Greek writings, we call that the Septuagint. But when it came down to the time of the first century, and of course even also in the time of St. Jerome, there were some variants. So which, which is the right meaning? You could say one word one way, you could say one word another. As I said, vulgate, vulgar, can mean a number of things. It can mean common, it can mean base, it can be now mean, you know, like sort of, you know, crass. But what meaning do you, are you expressing? Well, St. Jerome was able to incorporate those in the Latin based upon the Hebrew and the Greek, and it is a good, a good check. It's, it's a beautiful check that you can kind of see a deeper meaning. So when you, have, when you have an obscure passage, to ignore the Latin version, is gonna, you're going to lose out on the meaning. Because you know? if you have an obscure passage, you say, okay, here's the translation from the Greek. You still got to translate it from the Greek if you're going to learn it and understand it. What, is, what does that really mean? You know, and it's an obscure passage, even in the English. You can go to the Latin and find what was the nuance that St. Jerome had on that, and it can give you a little more enlightenment. So I think it's very, very helpful, to be quite honest. So, okay. Is Knights of Columbus compatible with the Catholic teaching? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I find that Knights of Columbus groups are, I don't know, I wouldn't say autonomous, but they... Uh, they can, they can go into many areas of work, and so they can be used for a lot of good, or they can not do a lot of things, or just do, you know, things that are, I mean, you know, so it's, it really depends on the council, the, the Knights of Columbus Council, uh, to see how, um, you know, how effective they are, they are as, a, as a men's group, okay, but it is compatible with, uh, with Catholic teaching, okay. We're running low on time here, let's see if there's any other, maybe I can answer perhaps one more. Hmm. Yeah, okay, and this, is, this might take a while to answer, but to what degree uh, are parishioners required to follow the specific teachings, opinions of their pastor? This is troubling because many pastors disagree with each other, but they all seem to have good reasoning. Well, yeah, we're in a difficult time today, and so um, you want to try and score things or, you know, rate things against tradition. Now, obviously, it takes you having to go and say, well, what was the tradition? You know, because you'll have some pastor that says this, you'll have another pastor that says something different. I understand that. That's a difficult position to be in. Uh, go back to what the tradition was. You have to kind of research. If you're in a, a pickle like this, uh, try and research the tradition. What was the tradition? What was traditionally held? What do the saints say on the issue? You know, and go with that. That'd be my suggestion. But pastors also have grace of state to guide their flock. Uh, grace of state means they have a particular grace given to them to help govern and guide their flock. That's why I'm, I'm even very hesitant about having this out on the census fidelum because this is going out to many other people and people who are not of my flock. I have grace to guide my parishioners. God gives me grace and insights to guide my parishioners for what they need. So there's there is a wisdom to following your pastor. Now, if you have a positive reason to say, okay, my pastor taught this, which is incorrect, then it's a different story. But uh, you should try and follow the pastor if, if at all possible. Okay, we're out of time. So let's close with the prayer, and we'll pick up in a couple of weeks with uh, chapter 6, that beautiful chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel. I hope you come back. We'll finish with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. 
St. John, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. I give you all a blessing. Benedictio de i omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super vos et maniat semper. Amen. God bless you.